a Heroes Welcome podcast. Hello, listeners. Thank you so much for joining us on this bonus episode. I'm Maria LaCare Diego, and I'm here today with my co host. And that's me, Liliana Balon. And we're here with a good friend, Jen. How do you want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Jen Shivia. I use she, her pronouns, and I am excited to be here and talking about our topic today. So, Jen, you had a really beautiful summary of our, as we were discussing earlier, like, how are we going to introduce this topic? How what well, how are you was gonna come back on me? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So our thought for this episode was we've been having a lot of conversations kind of internally about what uh, what does it actually mean to be a play therapist? And so if you know any registered play therapist, you know that this term is a little bit territorial. And I'm here to say that maybe we've gone a little bit too far. Maybe we pushed too hard on this. And I think that what has happened is the, the intent was to really strive for making sure that um, individual therapists who are calling themselves registered play therapists, um, or even just play therapists in general, I guess, actually had the training to do play therapy. I think there's a misconception that if you have a box of toys somewhere in your office and you pull them out when you have a child under a certain age in your office, that you do play therapy. And it's a completely different modality. It has tons of training. There's tons of nuances. There's a whole, you know, a whole level of stuff that you have to know um, to be able to actually be doing play therapy as opposed to doing talk therapy with a young child. So the conversation kind of became how can we empower people who do not want to become registered play therapists? Because re- being a registered play therapist. That's is, a long road. It's a long road. It's a lot of work. It's it's kind of confusing. It's not accessible to everybody. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think for so long it's been, you cannot be a play therapist unless you go through the whole everything with APT. Mm-hmm. Um and, and that's great. And you can do that, but it's just not accessible for everybody. So how can you be doing, you know, how can you be providing play therapy, um, even if you are not going to do the full registered play therapist path? Beautiful. Yeah. So this is uh, for everyone who's listening, APT is the Association uh, for Play Therapy. So this is not to say do not become, this is to say let's be educated about it. So I love the way that you did that intro. Um, I keep hearing of therapists who are doing interventions and they call it either play therapy or family play therapy, mm-hmm. and that's not what they're doing. Right. And we're not the only ones having this conversation. We're starting to see it a lot in our social media groups that we're a part of. You know, there's this discussion between play therapy, play based therapy, play therapist, and registered play therapist, right? And so it does start to get confusing if you're new and trying to find your way through um, what can you be called, what can you call yourself, what what can you use? Um, and then I, I like that you pointed out, it, you know, becoming a registered play therapist with the Association for Play Therapy is a long road. It's an expensive road. Um, you, we could argue that it's a very privileged program to like credential to achieve um, and we pause and say it is so it for is people of color for people who work in agencies hospitals rural communities, rural communities is not accessible to them and we have the good intent of of like well let's give them scholarships stop it that's an insult what you're doing yes it's a kind <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's. I know it's intended to be a kind gesture, but for example, I'm in New Mexico, and you know, half if you want to become a registered play therapist, half of your hours need to be in person live trainings with you in the room as a trainer. Mm-hmm. I believe I am one of maybe five in my entire state that provide CEs for APT. Yeah, right. in the middle of my state, there's nobody. There's nobody. Mm-hmm. So. 
to obtain these live hours, there's lots of travel and additional expenses that are incurred. And that's just not feasible for everybody, especially those new in our field. Thank it's you. not. It's not. And so I, uh, Liliana and I are close to Denver, Colorado. We live in a metropolitan area. There are still not a ton of live trainings for RPT. And, and you know, I just want to throw out there, too, that all of us are registered play therapist supervisors. Marie and I are both approved providers for play therapy through the Association for Play Therapy. So um, like we're not and, and we worked hard to get those designations and we mm -hmm. are proud of that. It's also, I don't know that I would have been able to do that had I not lived in a place that had access to all of that. And honestly, I did it under old rules that, you know, I was able to take a lot of my trainings live, but that was also, you know, I, I guess I'm not a seasoned therapist. Um, don't totally For like but... who's listening to us. Every time <sighs> that we complain about season, we do the air quotes. Seasoned oh, therapist. We need a new term. We just hate that term. We, but I mean, I, I know, I know. And it's also just like grappling with our own, like this, this is how old we are, I guess. But yes. yes, I've been practicing for about 15 years. And 15 years ago, um, we did not have all the Zoom meetings and all of the global access okay. that we do now. Um, we know now that you can do a really good training online, you know, um, is it awesome to do in-person trainings too? Yeah. But even living where I live now, there's not a lot because the games of every, everything has changed. It is really expensive to rent a space to yeah. be able to have these. Um, many of us, like we're, we're working out of our home offices mm -hmm. a lot, you know, um, um, and there are so many online trainings that yes, like Maria was saying to travel somewhere to get a training. Um, like it's a lot, it's a lot logistically, you know? So I think the accessibility. I, I Absolutely. Love that, right. And when we're talking about the attendee, right. Cause we can talk about the presenter we, and there's a lot of stuff there. And then we can talk about the uh, part, uh, participant. So even when you said the in-person life trainings, Maria, you were talking about, I was like, as a therapist, I have to miss income. Mm -hmm. I have to cancel clients to go take these trainings. And if I have to travel because you're not, I have to now get a hotel. Um, it's either airfare or gas. And let's be honest, it's equally expensive. Either one, yeah. I have to eat. So now it's costing me to get trained for something that you are requiring me, but you're not flexible to me. Mm -hmm. But let's come back. So this is yeah. the beauty of when the three of us get together and we're like, what is happening in our field? Um, so for all our listeners, let's go back and do a recap. So there's a difference between being a registered play therapist, which is a trademark mm -hmm. from APT. A play therapy is not trademark. We couldn't because it's too big. Yeah. Um, and we have play-based therapists. Uh, play therapist train like those are the two um uh what is the titles that i've been seeing quite often mm -hmm. and then we have uh trainings that are approved play therapy trainings and please look for that number for that seal usually it's a blue circle like it's a logo mm -hmm. to know that if you are on track if you want to go and be a registered play therapist which we're saying you don't have to but if you choose to then look for that number, look for that logo. And then we have a lot of play therapist certificates. And this is where we started our conversation because a lot of the new cohorts that are coming out, just because we're seeing doesn't mean that everyone has access to the same information. Right. So the new cohort that Jen and Maria were mentioning earlier is new therapists with are eager to learn they want to be uh, properly trained to work with this population. And we thank you for it. Um, so there's a lot of play therapist certificates out there that is very confusing for them. So they see play therapist certificate and they're like, that's it. I go get those. And then I will become a, a play therapist um, certified. That's the, that's the title. Certified, that yeah. Certified play therapist. Yeah. I'm like, there's no such thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, and there's a difference between taking a play therapy certificate and, and then being a registered play therapist or a play therapist certificate for a specific play therapy model. So there's three different things there. And right? those are just the ones we're aware of. I'm yeah. sure <laughs> there are 
there are so many other ideations of this idea out there, right? Because we know that play is universal. So we're aware of what's popping up in our circles, but I also can only estimate what we're not aware of that's continuing to happen out there, right? And I think that it's, I see it a lot with my play academy, right? I'll get lots of inquiries around my play academy. And like, is this a certificate program? What does this count for? Um, and so trying to just, you know, be really upfront with all of my own wording that I map out and provide everything so that you're eligible for the registered play therapy credential. I can't give you the credential that belongs to APT only, but I can I can get you to the door with application in hand. Um, and then it's up to them to approve it, right? Whereas these certificate programs, these certification programs, they are their own entity. So they can gift you whatever title they're giving with their certificate program. And that's just different than being the trademarked registered play therapist through APT. Not to say that it's one is necessarily better than the other. I think there is a lot of factors that go into that, including accessibility. Yeah. Um, you know, I know we've got, you know, certification programs popping up that are mostly online, um, you know, and they they try to, they seem to include a lot of, you know, theories for, for some of that, but they don't have the same requirements yes. that the registered play therapy certification has, which is, which is a lot. Yeah. So yeah. for all of you who are listening, when we're talking about play therapy certificates for credentialing, we're talking about outplay, we're talking about trauma play, we're talking about um, SPT, we're talking about their play, like their uh, filial, like there is a specific, um, and there's more that I'm missing. I was like, oh my God, who am I missing? Yeah. I know Terry Cutman. Oh, there's like Sand, Adlerian, yeah. Sandre, Sand play. There are, there's so many. There's so like, many out play there. Therapy. Yeah. Right? But now what we're saying with this podcast is please inform yourself. Associations are making this assumption about you which is one, you're educated, two, you have access to information because everyone has access to Wi-Fi, that's their assumption. Um, and therefore, you're going to be able to sort all of these out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's their assumption. And the reality is that there's a lot of ethical issues out there. I wanted to say unethical people, which, fuck it, I'm going to say it. There's a lot of unethical people out there. Right. The police. Yeah. Please, please, if you have questions, you can always reach out to any of us. You can always reach out to a registered play therapist supervisor and ask questions um, in regards to the academy, because I keep sending Maria people, which is um, something that I love about that is that a lot of the times when they change the credentials, uh, APT, when they change their standards, which Maria and I participated in those meetings, and we walk out feeling like, what just happened? And how are we going to explain this? And even for the APT, they were holding meetings to explain, which he was never explained. Sorry, guys, if you're listening to this, I doubt that you're going to be listening. But if you listen to this, um, <laughs> we were like, what does that mean? Yes. It, it yeah. took more than a year of them being consistent. But we're still at least hearing comments of they deny this. They don't want. So they're not even clear in regards to what is it, and they're not consistent on when they're accepting or not accepting. Now to even say that we have two different tracks. We have the university track, and then we have the private section. I was just going to say, we haven't even talked about the university track yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is a whole nother ball of, I mean, okay, so so I teach at a university that offers, um, they're an approved center for play therapy, and they offer a child and adolescent certificate program. So getting that child and adolescent certificate program, which, by the way, also would include way more hours than you actually need um, of training hours than you would need to get to fulfill the RPT requirements, does not make you a, a play therapist. It doesn't make you a registered play therapist. It means you have a certificate in child and adolescent therapy, right? Um, but it's confusing. I have so many supervisees just because that happens to be like a local university that we have a lot of supervisees from. And so they get out and they're like, okay, well, I did all this. Like, that is awesome. So that, yeah. that's one, right? Um, and so it's a good and bad thing. And I mean, it's it, so, I mean, the good thing about um, doing the whole 
registered play therapist track through APT is it all it's almost like um like a mini version of getting your licensure to begin with so um so you know if you're listening to this and you are not a mental health therapist to become licensed you need to go to grad school so you're gonna spend a lot of time and money learning how to be a therapist and after that you don't get to just like practice out in the world on your own you have two to three years at least that you are supervised by somebody else so everything you're doing is still kind of being monitored by somebody and you're tracking hours you have to have two or three thousand Depending on your state, and again, it's not consistent, we're going to have a whole other talk about that, but depending on your state, it's, you know, you have to have like thousands of hours under supervision and so much, you know, an X amount of supervision hours within that and X amount of trainings within that. So, you know, being a registered play therapist includes some of that. You have to be licensed. You can do all the stuff for your RPT and hold on to it. If you get done with it first because you can't have it until you're licensed, you have to have X number of supervision hours by an RPTS. You have to have X number of training hours. And that's like that's a lot of the problem that we're running up against is because some of those so many of those hours have to be in person and it makes it inaccessible. And so our fear is that because this seems a little unwieldy, you know, um, for is that a word? I'm yielding. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Difficult for other people, for you know, everybody to digest and put together. We don't want people deciding, okay, you know what, that's too complicated. I'm just, I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wing it, mm-hmm. or I'm not gonna work with kids at all. I'm just only gonna work with maybe like teens and up. Right, which um, is our which is our biggest fear because that's right. such a growing need. There's such a huge need for mm-hmm. play therapists. And so, yeah, then the conversation of who, yeah, who does own that title of a play therapist? And, you know, what does that mean if you're a certified play therapist versus a registered play therapist? Does it, does it matter? Does it, I mean, kind of because APT, and this was their intent to put the standards in place so that it was consistent and mm-hmm. to make sure that everybody had the same level of training which isn't working in terms of equity. So, right. Absolutely. Right. Or focus, but. right? The three of us here, I love I love the analogy of licensure by the way. Mm-hmm. I would like <laughs> that let it sink. Like a me. mini version. Yes. Yeah. But also when you want to tra- and and again for all of you who are listening, having this credential is a secondary credential. So you mm-hmm. need your licensure and then this is just a credential, additional letters to your name. That yeah. does not impress anyone, with the exception of other colleagues. But each state has a requirement of you not to um, practice outside the scope of therapy. So now when you get out of school, they tell you, go treat everyone because you are like ready to treat everyone. That's not true. They lie to you. Oh, not true. And then they tell you, you can treat any subject. That's not true. You need a specialization on it. So play therapy, that's exactly what it is. Even when you say... I work with teens. Yeah, that's still a specialty. There's mm-hmm. still things that you need to know. So this is the beauty of the foundations, the theories of play therapy. Play therapy is not just having games and playing and doing talk therapy. Yeah. Right? You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> we know who you are. We know who you are. That's called play-based, right? Play-based. Play-based. It's therapy. Yeah, it's- yeah, uh-huh. so elementary you're using, therapy. Yeah. You're using a play board, you're using Legos, you're using something in order, in order to engage in talk therapy. Yeah. Play therapy is completely different, right? We're, we're talking about awareness in regards to not only what model are we bringing in, which is not just one model. We're also thinking about, oh, because of this, I'm going to bring this intervention. What are the play themes that they're surfacing? What kind of play there? What kind of play is the child doing with me? What is the age of this child in front of me? Not only chronological, but developmental. Like there's all these things that come into play that the reason why APT went too extreme to this is because there was a lot of people using games and saying, I do play therapy, um, which is not true. You know it. We know it. Uh, and because of that, now we're all playing, <laughs> paying the price of having yeah. these extremes in regards to now we're micromanaged by an association because there was too many entities doing this. So yeah. this is, again, not to shame. This is to create. This is to provide information so that you are informed when you are designing, deciding what you're going to spend your money on, 
with who you're going to be spending your money on. And not only for you to start thinking of, it's not only the money that I'm giving you for this training, but it's my time Mm -hmm. and what track am I following? Is this just so that I can continue with CEs, continue education? Is this because I care about the population and I want to be trained? Or is it because, you know what? Fuck it. (laughs) I'm paying all this money. Might as well get the credential. Whatever you decide, whatever is important to you, we want you to be informed. That's Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we all hold the credential, we all believe in the credential, and we can all have issues with larger organizations and overarching authority organizations. Like you could, both of those things can and are true for the three of us. Um, mm-hmm. So when you're Liliana, when you were talking about like, you know, this, any trainings that that clinicians choose to go to, you know, it's a sacrifice of their own income. It's a sacrifice of their client availability. Um, And I think I'm starting to see a trend where we're just becoming much more picky and selective about what we are signing up for because we recognize now the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want to know personally that what I'm going to is going to be worth what I have given up to attend. Yeah. Um, and I didn't hold that, you know, that wasn't true for me five years ago. It was just like, sure. Training found, sounds great. That title. Fantastic. I just yeah. need my 40 hours or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, you know what, we're seeing a lot more destination conferences. We're seeing a lot more like out of the box thinking conferences. And I think it's because we are starting to see clinicians are not just accepting like the bare minimum anymore. And we are going to be really choosy about what we're spending our time and money and our clients' time on. Mm-hmm. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. I, and I think it's going to get better in regards to the way that we are picking because the old idea of, it's not that we're rejecting the old idea, is that we're saying like, this is great foundation and we're learning as we go. We are evolving. So we need more than just these ideas. This Let's is the pendulum like, swing. Yeah. Right. We we were over, we were too lenient before. Yeah. Now oh. we have overcorrected and we are too stringent and too exclusive and unattainable. That yeah. like our hope is that we are going to find that gray middle ground. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially as everything is becoming accessible. Mm-hmm. Now we're taking trainings in Australia. We're taking yeah. trainings, you know, in, in like in, in several parts of, of we, we, it used to be just the U.S. Now it's like, no, this topic is interesting and I'm willing to pay even if it doesn't qualify for this because of my clients. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So please, 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 associations, pay attention to this. Attention to pattern. We, we 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 really do want people to be trained in this. It is this is like this is this is the you know the niche that we are super passionate about, and that's why we hold those credentials. Um, and at the same time, we do recognize that you can get some of this training and not obtain that credential, and that's okay. And again, I said in the beginning, I think I think that play therapists, especially, and there's other modalities too. like EMDR has the same feel there's, you know, EFT, like they're, they're all, and for good reason, because you spend a lot of time and money and, you know, it's a lot to get certified in these things. Um, I don't think people totally realize that either. Um, you know, but there, there are smart ways to do it. So for example, if you have just graduated and you know, you want to do play therapy and it's your passion, you have to get licensure hours anyway. So be smart about it. Pick a supervisor who is also an RPTS so that you can do both at the same time. So you don't have to go back and do something later because then you can just be living your best life practicing, you know, doing your pre-licensure hours anyways, but you're tracking your play therapy hours at the same time. And you have to do CE units anyways for licensure. Be smart about it and do some of those that are play therapy trainings. Just make sure that they have the APT logo and they're from a provider or else they won't count, which really sucks to get to the end. And for us as supervisors to have to tell you, we are so happy you did all that, but it wasn't through an approved provider and none of that's going to count towards your right. APT RPT credit. So, you know, I mean, and this is also why we want to bring an awareness to it. There, there are there are ways that you can put this together to make it more, a little bit more accessible and make it make sense a little bit more. So even if you're not going to get the whole credential, you know, I tell my supervisees, if you're working with kids, just track your hours anyways. 
Like mm-hmm. you're already getting supervision from an RPTS. I can sign off on all your hours because you're being, because we're doing the thing anyways. So right. just start tracking your hours to start tracking your training. If you decide not to get it at the end, that's fine. But at least you don't have to go back and do anything, you know, yeah, because you decided ethical. you wanted it. Yeah. And from an ethical perspective, you do, you're doing it the right way because you are consulting with a service mm-hmm. supervisor who can guide you. Mm-hmm. Right. And then if you decide to do so, especially because APT now has faces that you have to follow. So this is what I mean about the micromanagement, because now they're telling you they're dictating what training you have to take, how many supervision before you can move to the next phase. So please Mm -hmm. go to the APT website again. um, This is not to endorse. This is not to say yeah or nay. This is to say be informed. Right. Go to the website and find out what will it take for you so that you can be informed in regards to the phases, the training that is required in each phase. And if you're like, what the hell? Welcome to the club. Right. Um, And this is email me. And then (laughs) contact uh, Maria because she did this beautiful template. When we all got together at the beginning and Maria shared, I was like, how many hours do you spend like doing? (laughs) And I was like, this is really good. (laughs) <laughs> it you made my in it for free. yeah it made my my math nerd brain real happy uh I love a good spreadsheet that does all the work for me right. um yeah you you know because I I did I sat down and I was like how do I make this accessible to the people in my community if I'm the only one that can give them live hours yes I can pull in other presenters and I do because I don't need everyone to think the way I think lord help them um you know so I do pull in others but like how do I make this and it it wasn't bad, right? Like I've mapped it out. It can be a two, uh, what my program is, is in two years, you, you are at the door ready to turn in your application. Um, I've been able to, to rescue some supervisors who are like, I don't do supervision outside of the academy anymore because I don't understand that math and I don't want to track all those things, um, which is nice. And you can take some of these trainees. You can have a supervisor and never want the credential. That's okay too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. It, it, and the reasoning for, by the way, we're saying that is because the same thing that you have to pay and renew your licensure, any credential that you have, you have to provide CEs to renew and you have to pay. So at the end of the day, most of us realize, yeah, it's not working out the math when I have to pay too many associations for too many credentials. Mm-hmm. So right. again, please know that once you get these credentials, you're going to be required not only to um, provide CEs and then to pay renewal, but also like now they're forcing you, they're forcing ways for you to be a member, not just to renew um, in order for them to continue getting money and continue loving. So there's reasons why they're doing this also. It's it's not a bad thing. They get to lobby for what they believe, not for what you believe, for Mm -hmm. what they believe. Right. Also the association. So as we're coming up, um, cause we were like, oh, we're going to do this in this time. And I was like, it's not going to work out. <laughs> um, ladies, what is one closing either statement or advice that you want to give to the people who are listening to this? I love how um, both of you went quiet and walk away. I was like, I'm looking at both of you. <laughs> what would be one? Yeah, visual learners. Um, thinkers. Um, mine is get the training, get the training. Just be picky about the training you get. And we don't care if you get your RPT. We're here for you if you want it. We don't care if you get it, but we do want you to get the training. Yeah, I love that. I think in addition to getting the training, ask the questions. If you're signing up for mm-hmm. a certificate program, if you're signing up for a certification, if you want to go for the credential, ask the questions. What does this mean for me? What is this actually going to take out of my time and money? And you decide if it's worth it. Only you can mm-hmm. decide. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as a summary, there's a difference between registered play therapist, that is a trademark from an association, it's a credential, from doing play therapy to being plain based to um, being play therapy trained. Um, you can call it whatever you want. What we're advocating is for doing ethically uh, therapy with this population. That's what we are advocating for today. So with that, please thank you. Well, please. Please be informed. Thank you for listening to us in this bonus episode. And we'll see you next time. Until next time. Thank you.